This is our series, More, and, and the springboard is really that, that, that statement or that phrase we speak to ourselves sometimes, there's got to be more than this. You ever done that? There's got to be more than this. There's, uh, uh, <laughs> there has to be more than just li- living and breathing and eating and dying. There's got to be more to life than this, or whatever it might be in your life, right? There's got to be more than this, a- a- and, and the answer of God to all that, th- and it's the Easter answer there is, and that's why Easter happened. It's God's great whisper uh, at a thousand decibels that there is, and it's found in his son, Jesus Christ. There is more than that. So that's, that, that's our series. We're, we're kind of exploring what that means in our lives. And today, it's a made to make a difference, and, and we're sent. Made to make a difference, uh, and, and we're sent. When Jane and I were first married, it's, uh, it was right towards the end of my college time. Uh, in fact, I had got my, my teaching credential. And, and so we, we got married. We bought a, a house in Huntington Beach, a fixer-upper. We spent a, a, a lot of time and effort fixing up the house, making it great. It was like two minutes from the beach, right? So, so we'd, uh, we, we, we went to the beach every evening. took a walk. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Every evening we were on the beach, right? I don't care if it was raining. It doesn't rain very often in Southern California. But even if it was raining, we were on the beach t- t- taking that walk, right? And sometimes I'd jump in the water and she's sitting and we, we just had this awesome life. We had a great church there, and, and we had this great house. We fixed it up, and it was in our budget. We, could, we were just having a blast. Everything our little hearts desired. And, and, and then um, about the time I had two or three or four offers to teach, I, I went through this, um, this discontentment of the soul. I don't know what else to call it. It was, it was really heavy. Um, and, and really, I think my my thought was there's got to be more than this now not not with Janie I mean that's awesome right she was always but she was supporting me through this which says something about her right um but there's got to be more than this and so uh I was really struggling with that I did some more stuff at church and I I did uh, nursing home services played the piano and talk and stuff there and I'd help out with kids and and I took some classes at Christ College Irvine and and uh, you know after about a year I, I had a class with the president of the of the, uh, the first president of the college, and I, Dr. Mansi, and I finally said to him, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering about this pastor gig. I don't know whether, whether that's something I should consider or not. And he, was, he just kind of fast-forwarded everything, fast-tracked everything, and within a couple months, we sold our house, and we went to India. So I have a question for you, though. Um, I was sent and called to do that, but was I less sent and less called... Uh, than when I was student teaching and I was able to connect with these punk rockers who only believed in violence uh, because I happened to break up a fight and all of a sudden I could tell them there was something more greater than violence. It was called the love of God in Jesus Christ. Was I any less sent there than I was to go be a pastor? Was I less sent in college when there's a philosophy professor that stood up and said, it was a big public institution, and he said, just like Buddha, Jesus never claimed to be God. And when I, and when I talked to him, he actually gave me, you know, 20 minutes in class to talk about how Jesus claimed to be God. Was I any less called there than I was to be a pastor? Was I any less called in a, in a, a health class for, to, for people going to be teachers? And out of the blue, the guy calls me, you there in the third row, you, what, what's the foundation for your mental health? And I was like cornered. Didn't want to say anything, but I was cornered. I had to say my faith relationship in Jesus Christ because that's the only thing that was true. Was I any less called to be in that place at that moment than I was to go, to go where it snowed to go to, go, to go to school? Was I any less called to be a husband than to go be a pastor? Was my wife any less called to be a teacher? She touched hundreds of children and their parents, she had the joy of teaching a Christian school in Costa Mesa, California. And was she any less called to do that than to go, go, go with me to go to the seminary? How about you in your life? Are you any less called to be on mission with Jesus? Are you any less called as, as a husband or a wife or as a mother or a father? as a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister? Are you any less called as, as a friend or, or where you work or where you play to be on mission with Jesus? Because you see, all that stuff I talked about, that really doesn't matter. It's really not about me. It's about you. And this wonderful gift that Jesus gives you, that you were made to make a difference, 
and he sends you out in him and for him to make that difference. Purpose and meaning, a mission. In the midst of our crying out, there's got to be more than this. Jesus says, yeah, I give you purpose and meaning, a mission. And, and, and it's, not, it's not way up here. It's not like this is more than this. It's not like one person is more. No, no, no. Wherever I put you in every relationship that you have, in every situation of your life, with every single person you rub shoulders with, you're on mission. You are on mission 24-7. No matter what the situation in your life, whether everything around you is falling apart and you're on mission, how can you be on mission there? Have you ever seen the witness people can have about Jesus in their life when their lives are falling apart? Or when your husband or wife is just trying to hold you together and it's so hard? You ever thought about yourself being on mission? come alongside with the love and support of Jesus Christ or your children or, or your parents this is the gift God gives us there's got to be more than this there is every moment of every day we have purpose and meaning being on mission with Jesus so we, we've done this throughout this series uh, watch me here and then you can do it after me I matter I belong to Jesus. I was made to make a difference. I am sent on a mission. Ready? I matter. I belong to Jesus. I was made to make a difference. I am sent on a mission. You know, if, if you get this, you really could just go home right now. I don't want you to. <laughs> uh, we're going to look at, at God's word. His spirit comes through the word to make it more clear and to apply it to our lives. But, but this is it. This is what I want you to take home and by the power of God's spirit to live in. This is it. You were created to make a difference and you're sent on a mission to be Jesus in this world. This Easter appearance takes place um, on Easter evening and the disciples are in this upper room and they have the doors and windows locked. Now, through the years, I've heard it preached uh, so often and it's just kind of assumed that these were just the 11. It, it couldn't be the 12, right, because Judas had hung himself, so it couldn't be the 12. But a lot of folks think, well, this was just the 11 here. But, but really, that's not true. If you were in worship a couple weeks ago, we looked at that text in Luke that talked about these two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus appeared to them uh, and, and then they, they recognized him that evening in the breaking of the bread and they ran back to Jerusalem and they went to these 11 in this room and we know one of those guys is named Cleophas, so he's not one of the 11. We don't know what the other guy was named, but, but, but it probably wasn't one of the 11. And then when they, got there, it said, when they got there, it says in Luke, they were there with others and with the women. So in this room... You basically had all the Christians at that time. This wasn't just something that Jesus st uh, uh, appeared in the middle of the 11 with. This was all the Christians at that time. The women believers, Cleopas, and whoever the other, whoever the other guy was, right? Like, oh, I don't know who he was. And a few others, and the 11. And they were frightened, and they were scared, and their world had crumbled around them. They were frightened of the Romans. They were frightened of the Jewish leaders. They thought their lives might end at any moment. And they, were, and they were very much ashamed of themselves why they'd all ran away from Jesus. They'd all failed. They had no peace in their life. They had nothing to cling on. They knew there had to be something more, but they knew it couldn't possibly come from them because they were utter failures. Jesus appears and he says this, peace be with you. Okay, guys, let out of breath, he says. Peace be with you. <laughs> this peace, uh, uh, if you were a Jewish, even today, the, the word is shalom. Huh? And if you do a little work with this word, it, it means this transcendent peace of body and soul and mind and spirit. But, but it's not abstract stuff. It, it's connected in relationship with God. It's, it's all about relationship and this, this piece of body and soul and mind and spirit, experiencing it uh, through this relationship with God. That's what Jesus was bringing to them. That's, that was his gift to them. Peace be with you. Uh, in a sense, he was saying this, you matter. You belong to me. 
There were so many yeah buts here. Yeah, but we screwed up. Yeah, you did. Huh? Yeah, but, we, we, I mean, we're so frightened we're in this. Yeah, you are. Yeah, they might get us. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of, no, no, but you have my peace. You see, that's what Jesus did through the cross and the empty tomb. He took our brokenness, our hurt, our pain, even our death on himself. He took our guilt on himself, and he won on Easter morning. He, in the midst of this room, he says, peace be to you. Certainly, he brings them forgiveness, but he also brings them honor, right? You're mine. And he brings them the resurrection power. Tell me, why do you think these words are written down for us? I mean, it, it couldn't have been for the disciples. They had all, all the Christians at that time experienced this. It was, it was for you, see. Just as surely as Jesus stepped into this room bodily and said, peace be to you this morning, right now in this moment, he's here. And the spirit of God is stepping into the room of your heart and your mind and your soul. And he's whispering you, peace to you, peace be with you. Where do you need that in your life? What enemies are you frightened of? Where don't you measure up? Where is there stuff you can't make right? Where are those enemies headed up by death itself that you cannot beat? Peace be with you. Have you ever um, watched uh, the, the weather? Uh, I, I never watched the weather in Southern California. You never had to. It was always sunny, right? <laughs> But, but that's pretty true. But I went to the Midwest, and, and the crazy thing is you watch the weather in the Midwest, right? Cause, I mean, because it changes. You actually got that white stuff there. And it, it can be, de- yeah, so, so you kind of, you learn to watch the weather. And in Denver, we watch the weather too. And sometimes these storms, especially in Denver, they'd, they'd uh, come, there's a little pocket between Colorado Springs and Denver. And sometimes these storms would come over and they just sit there. And, and, and you'd see the, on the Weather Channel, you'd see the satellite thing. and whoosh, You know, you've seen that, right? And it just kind of sits there. Sometimes with hurricanes, they show that. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. As long as we have to sit here, we sit here. As long as we need to rest in this grace. I, I, I don't know where you're at. You see, what Jesus says after this is all dependent on this. If, if I had time, I, I'd love to sit with each of you and talk about this this morning. Where do you need to let this settle in your soul? Because this peace and this life with Jesus is for you. And there's so much that gets in the way of it. How long do we need to sit here before you can let a breath out? And just rest in this reality. Just receive and trust this reality. If we're not sitting here long enough, we need to go home today, sit in this place a while longer, okay? Before you try to do anything else. Jesus steps into your heart with these verses, and he says, peace be with you. Life with me. Even, um, even in this text, he repeats these words for emphasis. He says, peace be with you again. It's like he's telling the disciples to sit here a minute. Just get this first. And so he says, after you get this, then then we'll talk about what comes next. huh? And so he says, peace be with you again. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So what did the Father send Jesus for? He had everybody uh, serve him, right? It was all about him, wasn't it? His identity was found in that, in that everybody kowtowed to him. Is that right? No, his identity was found in that he came to save. He came as a servant. When he walked this earth, he connected with people in love. I, I remember um, just a couple weeks ago, outside of BJ's in Roseville, there, Roseville Parkway, there was this guy um, on the corner, and he was holding up a sign and screaming, repent, repent, the end's coming, repent, right? And, and, and there was no connection with anybody. It's not what Jesus did. He, he, he went into the towns and the villages 
he, he sat and had dinner with those outsiders, those sinners. He called the 12 to do life with him. He set the, the 5,000 down in a group of 50s to share their life. He came into our world and into our lives, took our brokenness upon himself at the cross, and he won on Easter morning. It is finished. He finished that part of his mission. So the Father sends us. He's, he, the Father has sent me. Now I am sending you to do what? To serve and to love in his name. How do I do that? It's so hard. It's like the whole world's out there. What do I do? Why don't we start with those who are close to us and work our way out from there? What do you think? Huh? Why don't we start with connecting with people in relationship wherever we're at? You know, those people who, um, who we're kind of blind to lots of times? I, I got gas last night at, at uh, AM, PM, and, and I walked in, and I said, how you doing? Whoa, it blew him away that somebody actually cared about this guy, you know? We had a nice little conversation. I had to get out of there because there was going to be a line here, but I had to get out. The point was, yeah, yeah, it's amazing when you try to connect with people. They want to be connected with. When, when you're at the gym and you talk to somebody and say, hey, you, you want to pray about that right now? Oh, man, it blows people away. I think it also blows people away in your family when you do that. When you just touch someone with that touch of love and say, hey, let's pray about this. As a father has sent me, I am sending you. You say, oh, it's so hard. And this is what Jesus said. With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What's going on here? Why does that even connect? As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Remember how Jesus' ministry started? It started with his baptism. That's where his public ministry started. He went to John, right? And he was baptized. And, and, and the Bible says that the Spirit of God was poured out on him with all of his power. What does that mean? I thought he was true God. He's also true man. According to his, his, his human nature, the Spirit of God was poured out on him with all of his power. And the voice of the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When the 3,000 came to faith on Pentecost, you remember that day when Peter gets up, he preaches this kicker of a sermon? And, and they say, what do, we, what do we need to do? And he says, repent. Repent means to change your mind. Change your mind from walking in your life apart, and apart from God, disconnected from God in Jesus Christ, and receive Jesus Christ in every corner of your life, the forgiveness and the life that he, that he offers you. See, repent. Change your freaking mind and receive life here. And be baptized. It's like Jesus saying, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, be baptized. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Why? What, what's the deal with baptism? It says, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what, what happened with Jesus? The Spirit was poured out of him in all his power. The power of the Spirit is poured out on us. Not to its full extent, but to what each of us needs. Where? In our baptism. It's where our ministry, our sentness begins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who the Lord our God will call. As the Father has sent me, just where my ministry started, yours does, I will send you in your baptism. Oh, and it's there that the voice of the Father says to you, this is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son. You are sent, you are named, you are empowered, you are loved, you are treasured, just like Jesus. Whoa. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. We say, oh man, what does that mean? What does that mean? This is what it means. Peace be with you. That's what we do. That's what this forgiveness is. It's relationship with God restored. That's why we're always looking and never finding, right? Because <laughs> we're cut off from the one thing we can be fulfilled in, the relationship with God. Jesus connects us again. And so our message is, is Jesus' message. Peace be with you. How does that happen? In the cross, in the empty tomb, peace. This fullness of the soul that you're searching for, this connection with God. It's what we bring 
in our lives. Great question, though, is this. So what does this look like uh, fleshed out? Uh, it, it looks like Jesus. What I mean, lots of times we have all those pretty phrases and all that nice phraseology and, and this abstract, and, oh, that sounds wonderful, Pastor, but what does this look like in my life? Pretty good question, huh? And I would answer, it looks like Jesus. If you get a chance, next couple of weeks, read through one of the Gospels. I don't care which one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read through it with one question in your head, what, did De- what is Jesus doing? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. What is Jesus doing? Because that's what I'm supposed to do. The first thing you notice is that he's connected to people in relationship. It's what he does. The first miracle he did, now think about this. He, he's, he started his, his public ministry. He's calling his disciples. He gets an invite from a family friend to go to a wedding. Does he say, I'm too busy, man. I got to be on mission? No, he connects with the family. Oh, and by the way, while he's there, he loves them so much, he turns water into wine. So nothing's spoiled. Jesus didn't hang up his shingle at Hebrew University and say, y'all come. He came into their lives. He did life with others. What does it look like for us? We do life with each other, with those who are close to us, with one another and those who are farther away. We, and it's not this have a happy on the surfacey thing. We give ourselves to others in relationship. It's what Jesus did. And he connected with people where they were hurting. He, he connected with people in their, in their brokenness, in their pain, in their hopelessness, in their sickness, even face to face with death. This is where he connected with people. Those who were ostracized, he, he connected with them and he healed them and he helped them. What does this look like in our life? Where's one who is close to you who's hurting? Maybe that's a place to start. Not with some nebulous, be nice. But with the love of Jesus and with his peace. Where is someone who's a little farther away? Who needs to be connected to the love and and truth of Jesus. Peace be to you. This is what Jesus did. He connected with people, he healed them, and he pushed back the evil one. I'm just reading in Luke, it's a great text, where he throws all of, all of these demons out of this one poor guy that's been, that, that's been possessed, right? And he throws them all out, and then he says to the guy, go tell your friends what God's done for you. You see, Through that same word of Jesus, we push back the evil one and all of his minions. And and, and by the way, we give him far too much credit. The Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against. Now think about that for a minute. Hell is never on the offensive. Gates are a defensive position. We're storming the gates, baby. And you know what? If you never play offense, you can't ever win. Isn't that awesome stuff? We're the ones playing offense. With everything we do, we're pushing back evil. We're bringing the healing touch of God into the lives of of others close and far away. And we're speaking the truth. Always speaking the truth because from that comes everything else. It looks like Jesus. Looks like Jesus as as he gently touches the man who can't see and heals him. As he puts his children, the children on his lap as he weeps with the sisters and family of Lazarus, Lazarus, it looks like Jesus as he heals and helps and has compassion and does life with those around him. You were made to make a difference. How do I do that? Take a look at how Jesus did it. Because you're going out on his power, right? In Philippians it says, finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about, do such things. I love this verse. Uh, When my kids were getting a little older, uh, every once in a while they would ask me to do something sketchy. 
and they would like maybe go, go, go to a movie that was kind of sketchy. And, and they'd say to me, Dad, can we do that? And, and I'd look at them and I'd smile and I'd start to say this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure. And they'd say, oh, Dad, man, that's, you know, no, I can, we can't do it then, right? We can't do this. Uh, but they never said to me, and I think this is important, they never said to me, well, I think this is noble. Or I think this is good. Or I think this is right. See, they understand that that God set those things, not us. And so when we read these words, this is not about having a happy. It's not about being nice. It's about being Jesus. That's what it's about. And bringing his truth and bringing his love into the life of others, bringing his standard in everything we say and do. Because finally, anything other than that brings brokenness, brings struggle, brings sorrow, and brings death. Paul goes on. It's it's what he's saying when he goes on. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, here's the standard how I've lived and worked in Jesus as an apostle. And then he goes beyond that. And the God of peace, he points from himself to God. Here's the standard, you see. The God of peace. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. My word is truth. And the God of peace will be with you. We share life. We create friendships and we inspire hope. Why? It's how Jesus lived. We share our very selves, and in that, we bring the message of peace. We come alongside of people, and as Jesus says, I call you my friends, we're sent to make these connections, and we inspire this hope. But biblical hope is not, uh, is not a question mark, it's a certainty. God's peace, sins forgiven, living in it. In the midst of hopelessness, we bring the sight and the sound and the smell of hope. There's something greater, and it's the victory of Jesus. It's what we bring into those who are close to us and those who are far away. Purpose, meaning, a mission, 24-7, 24-7, what a gift, everything has meaning, because you bring Jesus into that moment in that place, let's do this again, ready, I matter, I belong to Jesus, I was made to make a difference, I am sent on a mission, so this week, Where do you need to receive anew God's peace in Jesus? Uh, This is so important for me. Everything we talked about, unless we sit here in this place as long as we need to, uh, the the rest of it, it it just doesn't work. You gotta know this peace and this grace in your life. This is the power source. This, This is the place. Let this hurricane of God's grace hover over you as long as you need. So this week, where do you need to receive anew God's peace in Jesus? Where do you need to receive anew that you matter, that you belong to Jesus? By grace through faith, do it. And where in your life have you lost purpose and meaning? Where have you forgotten that you were on a mission, that you were made to make a difference? And where do you live like it? Receive brand new by grace through faith, the purpose and meaning, the mission of being sent by Jesus to be Jesus in your world. For you were made to make a difference in Jesus. In Jesus, you are the sent one. What does this mean for you right now? May God's spirit guide you this week. Amen.